Thank you very much. This is a, a real pleasure. I, I love these conferences. I think more than any of the scientific, purely scientific conferences I go to because I get to talk to people. I, don't, I get to talk to people I don't normally see. Uh, those include the patient advocates, but also the business people and the lawyers and the, and the um, philanthropists and the um, regulatory people. So um, it's a great pleasure to talk about two things that are uh, closest to my heart. Uh, there are two things that grip me and keep me uh, going back into the lab every day that, uh, that inspire me. One is stem cells, which I've worked on for almost my entire career. And the other is the human genome, which keeps revealing new and exciting qualities. And the combination of being able to work on stem cells and genomics is a, um, is a wonderful dream for me. Um, so what I'm going to do today is to just, um, assuming, yes, I do. Um, so I'm, I'm used to using my own computer up here, so I have strict instructions, those guys back there, to help me if necessary. Um, what I'm going to do is give you a quick overview, essentially sort of a historical perspective. I'm really going to talk almost entirely about our own work, but we've started it fairly early. Um, and it's always had a focus on stem cells and genomics. So just to put you into perspective, there are two kinds of stem cells. There are pluripotent cells, like embryonic stem cells, which give rise to any kind of tissue. And then there are multipotent stem cells, which exist within us and serve to um, regenerate somewhat um, um, inadequately um, cells that die during our lifetimes. I think the best way, however, to remember them is this is a pluripotent stem cell, and this is a multipotent adult stem cell. OK. Um, so the reason we can do genomics is because uh, stem cells are a tool, but genomics are a tool, too. So the kinds of tools that have been developed and are continually developed at a rapid rate include tools that allow us to look at the gene expression which genes are active in cells? What, cell, what makes a cell a cell type? Why does it have a certain particular function? That's due to its um, gene expression phenotype. And there are a couple of methods for looking at this, uh, the gene expression uh, profile. One is uh, microarray-based, and the other one is sequencing. And similarly, um, looking at the genomic sequence, which is the linear sequence of DNA that we have in all of our cells, that's where the instructions for the RNA are kept. There are also two ways of looking at these, a, an array-based um, um, assay just to look at, at um, selected parts of the genome, and next-generation sequencing, which looks at the entire uh, 3 billion base pair sequence. The most interesting thing that's happened in the last few years is the uh, growing um, understanding that the regulation of all these things put the genome and the gene expression together. There has to be something that actually causes the genome to express certain genes and not others. And that's what we call the epigenome. It's outside the genome, but it is what regulates the um, expression of particular genes in particular cells. And we have uh, right now, this is a very important um, tool development area because it, is, it puts a whole level of com a new level of complexity and uh, gives us a new um, way of understanding how cells work and then there, thereby how disease happens. Uh, the methods that um, are, are commonly used are called chromatin analysis, but are otherwise known as ChIP-seq. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. One of my speakers, who I hope is here, Bing Ren, is an expert in that area, and um, we hope that he'll talk about that. Um, DNA methylation is a modification of the actual DNA sequence, which causes the uh, turning on and turning off of particular genes. So these are dynamic processes. <coughs> and as you'll see from my talk, even the one in the middle, which is the, the linear sequence, has a certain uh, dynamic quality as well. So I'm going to go very quickly through a number of, of uh, studies that we've done using stem cells and genomics to ask particular questions. And many times the question is, um, what's going on? Uh, uh, this is not a hypothesis sort of driven um, um, enterprise. We, uh, we don't, we, we, this is discovery. 
uh, generating um, technology. So what I'll talk to you about first is our, um, our early work in which we decided to look at very large scale um, molecular analysis of, of human pluripotent stem cells. Um, and what we, want, what we wanted to do is, was to find out what all stem cells had in common, not just what one stem cell line happened to have. So we wanted to know what the stem cell characteristics were. And we used gene expression to do that. And then uh, we've gone on to look at the genomic stability of the cells as they grow in culture. Uh, we are um, entering the era of the epigenome. We've studied the, the, um, the epigenome of cells in culture and their implications for this whole disease modeling and drug development that people have been talking about. Um, there is a project that is uh, not, not published yet, which I call Stem Cells, the Universe and Everything. The idea is to put all available data together and try to understand how stem cells change as they differentiate. So I'll give you just a short introduction to that very large project. And then finally, I'm going to give you one example in which we can, we can combine all the aspects of stem cells, translational medicine, and genomics, um, why all of these tools are extremely important for the treatment of a particular development of treatment of a particular disease, in this case will be multiple sclerosis. Okay, so the, the orig origin of this idea that we need to look at a lot of cells came both from the fact that there was technology available. There had been gene expression microarrays um, developed by Illumina. Illumina is a, uh, we have a representative from Illumina on our board, I mean on our panel, and also Illumina is a San Diego company. Um, they had developed a way to look at the entire gene expression profile of cells using a microarray-based uh, method. So. Um, this fellow here uh, standing next to me on a beach in Maine was really the inspiration for all of this. He and I, he's my first postdoc, Franz Joseph Mueller, and he and I spent a lot of time talking about and trying to figure out how to get funding for a large-scale analysis of all the embryonic and other types of stem cells that we could get our hands on. And our first, we, we called this the stem cell matrix. That's, that terminology comes from Franz Joseph. We decided that it was going to grow. We started with this first paper with 153 samples. And you'll see as I go through my talk that at each, each interval, each technology that we use, I'll tell you that we used X number of samples, but that's really just to tell you that we always look at samples in the hundreds, not in the tens or the ones. So this is the idea. The idea was to get an unbiased view of what was going on in stem cells using the genomics tools we could get our hands on. So we have gathered cells from all around the world. We didn't have the budget or the ca capability to grow 100 embryonic stem cell lines. And so we uh, went out into the stem cell community. Uh, it was a remarkable experience because people from all over the world trusted us with looking at their cells. Um, in, and we, with the idea that um, they trusted us not to say their cells are really bad and everybody else's cells are really good based on our analysis. So, um, so that was really the key and that, that's still the key to our, our ability to do these large scale anal analyses or our, the trust of our collaborators. So uh, would you play that movie just a bit? So this is just a PCA plot of um, a map of, thank you. That was very short, <laughs> it's perfect. So what we did was, uh, this is a PCA plot which shows the, the, that we can separate um, pluripotent from differentiated cells very easily based on the gene expression profile. And the reason I asked him to stop here was because I wanted to show you this, um, this these are IPS cells and e ES cells. I wanted to show you that the distribution of all pluripotent stem cells is along a spectrum. All the cells aren't exactly alike, but they all live within a particular space, which we can define. And I've outlined a few of these, um, these areas in, uh, in that same graph here. All the differentiated cells, because of the way we analyze the data, obviously, all the differentiated cells end up in one corner, but the pluripotent cells are spread out across the spectrum with embryonic stem cells at the top of this and embryonic stem cells at the bottom. They're just made in different labs, but they have exactly the same capabilities. They're all pluripotent and give rise to every cell type. And in the middle, we have a mixture of induced pluripotent stem cells and embryonic stem cells, which have exactly the same um, profiles as complete overlap. So the take-home message from this is that um, the um, 
I, embryonic stem cells and iPS cells have a lot of variation uh, in that class, but they are the same cell type. And I'm going to bring that home a whole bunch more times, and then at the end I'll ask you whether you've convinced, whether I've convinced you or not. So we wanted to um, ta use our, our data um, to tackle a real problem um, in the field of stem cell biology, and that is how do you ask, how do you tell whether your cells are pluripotent or not? So all that we do derives from mouse work that was done in the 1980s, and that is uh, work in which the first embryonic stem cells were shown to be pluripotent, that is, able to give rise to an entire mouse by making a, a chimeric my, mouse and showing that the cells could actually give rise to an entire mouse. So obviously when we start working on human pluripotent stem cells, that was not a technology that was available to us. So uh, instead, we, used, we brought out an old technology that had been used even before embryonic stem cells existed, and we, in, we injected um, our pluripotent stem cells, or our, our candidate pluripotent stem cells, into an immunocompromised mouse, and we allowed those cells to grow and form a tumor, and then we would analyze the tumor to see what sorts of cells would, de would develop. And this is pretty classic histology. I'm not even going to point out things that some of you probably, over on the, um, actually, I think I have a pointer. So over here is uh, the tumor that's formed in the testes of the mouse. This is the tumor and the other testes. So you can see it's quite large. Uh, these these um, um, are about eight weeks or so. We, we sacrifice the animals and the tumors become too big. And then if you look inside the tumor, you see you have pigmented cells up here. These are pigmented retinal cells, which are the same cells which are being used in clinical trials for macular degeneration. Uh, there's some cartilage over here, there's some glandular tissue, and there's some neural type tissue. So it's a mess, but it's all there. So that means that we've proven that our cells are pluripotent. Okay, so this is a, um, an assay that has some uh, problems. And uh, I think many of us in the field, including this person who I've quoted here, Owen Witte, said, thought that the teratome assay was the most ridiculous assay on the planet. Um, so we uh, thought we could probably do better. And based on our data, we thought we would be able to tell whether a cell was pluripotent or not without having to put the cells in a mouse. So this is the, um, the publication on a um, bioinformatic, it's a molecular diagnostic test for pluripotency that we call pluritest. Uh, pluritest is unlike other m sort of marker-based. We're not looking for a set of markers in these cells that suggest they're pluripotent. We look at the entire genome, uh, gene expression profile. We, get to, we take all the information. We use the information about which cells are not, which genes are not being expressed as well as what genes are being expressed. So that's why I say it's not biomarker based. Um, so we um, have um, uh, developed this, um, this method for looking at um, both of two qualities of the cells. And this is, is an also an, additionally, an additional utility of looking at the entire genome that we can tell whether the cells are pluripotent based on how similar they are to model cells that we know are pluripotent because we've tested them by, by the teratoma assay. Okay, so we have a, a correlation. We took 400 cell lines and, and uh, mapped them and discovered they all showed up in here in the upper left-hand corner of this graph. Um, but, the, um, but the other um, thing about pluritest is that it also allows you to see whether your cells are typical or atypical. That's what we call the novelty score. Let me show you some examples of that. First, I'll tell you how you do this. This is really, really hard. Um, so far, 500, we have 500 members who have registered on this free website, um, pluritest.org. And since, uh, as of uh, a couple of days ago, there have been 7,600 assays done using this, the pluritest um, um, assay. Um, it's used by most of the major iPS cell cores, and yeah, we have found it. So what you do is you, gene, you run a gene expression microarray. You can have a core do it. You can send your sample out and have it done. Um, you go to the website and you upload your raw data. This means you never have to talk to a bioinformaticist. You just get the data straight off the machine. You upload it to the site. 
And in just a few minutes, it's now on the Amazon cloud, so it doesn't take very long, you get two scores, the pluripotency and the novelty scores. So a typical pluripotent stem cell will have a high pluripotency score and a low novelty score, because it looks like all the others. If cells are slightly, if, size cells, if the cells are differentiated, they will drop in their pluripotency and increase in their novelty. And um, if the cells have a high pluripotency score and yet seem to be novel, that means there's something abnormal about them. So we can actually discern certain genetic conditions like schizophrenia that has, have large insertions because their gene expression profile is different and they move over to the novelty, over in the novelty space. Okay, so here are some examples. Uh, this is one of Franz Joseph's studies in which he was studying uh, neural differentiation. You'll notice that the cells start up here um, in the beginning, and as they differentiate, they start sliding down towards the uh, differentiated part. This is a, a published paper from uh, another group. These, um, a lot of people are using this. We don't collaborate with them. These are independent uh, studies. This is a study that was looking at a number of cell lines that were separated by a number of cells that were separated by different markers. And as you can see, they, have, they can separate them very well into the pluripotent space, and then there's, some of them are sliding down towards higher novelty and less pluripotency. And just two more really quickly. Patient-specific iPS cells have been mapped this way. Um, again, you see that the cells all fall into this space. No mice involved, no teratoma necessary. These cells are accepted as pluripotent. And then finally, this paper, which uh, showed that uh, when you reprogram cells, I, I really want to point this one out because I think it's really a fundamentally interesting concept. And that is that when we reprogram cells from fibroblasts, the fibroblasts themselves are heterogeneous. And so when we reprogram the cells, we come up with a heterogeneous population of different induced pluripotent stem cell lines. That's, that's, gen, that's genomic diversity. So the cells actually have different gen, genetic sequences. It's something we wouldn't have thought of if it hadn't been for people who did this sort of really uh, in-depth work. Okay, so that's all I'm going to talk about for uh, gene expression. We continue to do this. The um, stem cell matrix, which I mentioned to you, now has, um, has about 11,000 samples in it and includes not just uh, stem cells, but also fetal tissues and adult tissues, because our ultimate goal is to try to find out how similar cells that we make in culture are to the adult cells that we hope to replace. So I'm going to take a moment to tell you about uh, the, how the genome changes, if you don't, and, and it will change right out from under you if you aren't paying attention. Um, one of the concerns about transplantation of stem cells, the major concern, is um, that they will form tumors. And this picture right here tells you why people are concerned. This is a, um, a slide um, of, it's, it's, um, it's fish, fluorescent in situ hybridization, showing a spread of all the chromosomes in um, the, one of the embryonic stem cell lines. And it, here we've marked um, the uh, two chromosomes that show up very often in uh, malignant um, uh, teratic carcinoma cells. And as you see, these cells are, these, their cells are aneuploid. They have three copies of these, gene, of these chromosomes. And this cell line, um, this is an H9 cell line, which we grew in our lab for a while. And you notice that it has uh, three copies of chromosome 12, and it still has two copies of chromosome 17. This happens a lot. And the reason is that there's a selective pressure in a culture dish. I mean, the culture dish, we, we put the cells into conditions that they adapt to. And the cells that adapt are often abnormal because this is an abnormal environment. We have to keep that in mind. Um, this is just the slide I told you. I'd always say that we did, looked at hundreds of samples. And this is the publication in which we showed that there are changes in the copy number, that is the, the, um, the Number of, uh, the number of copies of a particular sequence with time and over time and culture. This is a map of what we call SNP genotypes. These are, that's a, that microarray method I told you about which samples the genome. And I think you can see this, this is published so you don't need to write all this down. Um, but you can see that where this red is, that's where we found duplications. 
Um, and then we also found deletions. They're actually a little bit harder to find, so we weren't as confident of finding deletions. But you'll see that many of the chromosomes, and this is a very large collection of cells and uh, cell lines we just brought together, and you'll notice that many of them have full chromosomal duplications. And also, many of them have uh, partial duplications. Let's see if I can actually see, like in here. So let me show you um, uh, a... Uh, closer view of uh, some of those. So we found that over and over again, we would find the same, the same copy number changes. And um, they were often near genes that were involved in pluripotency and self-renewal, which is what these cells are really good at. And this indicates the cells adapting to the cultures over time. Well, I'll show you one example of that. Um, this is a, um, one duplication we saw over and over again. This is on uh, chromosome 12. And as you'll see, the many, in many cultures, the cells were, had an entire extra copy of 12. But in many of them, they had just this section here. So if we look at the map of the genome in just this section here, we see that the, the, um, that the duplication occurs very close to a gene called NANOG, which is one of the intrinsic pluripotency-associated genes. But it's not in NANOG itself. It's in a pseudogene that is expressed in pluripotent stem cells. Now, I realize that it won't impress very many of you, but some of you, I think, ought to think about that a little bit. The, the, um, the impact of having extra copy of a pseudogene, which doesn't make a protein, but does make messenger RNA, what's the impact of having that extra messenger RNA in the cell? And the lower panel, this is a map of chromosome 20, which shows that there's a much larger region here uh, that's duplicated, and it's very close to, but doesn't include a um, DNA methyltransferase, which is um, very active in, um, in pluripotent stem cells and is a direct link into the DNA methylation that we'll talk about later. Um, this is uh, very highly expressed in embryonic stem cells and is probably um, the reason for some of their unique qualities. So you'll see there's a whole lot of genes that are duplicated. Uh, among those is one called BCL2L1, which is actually an oncogene. So um, you can see that things that make the cells divide faster, um, they'll, they'll select for those uh, differences. Let me keep going. Um, I want to show you that this changes with time and culture. This is a SNP. Um, this is what you see when you do a SNP genotyping. Um, usually you'll see all these little dots right across the middle, and that's because this is one of the alleles. This is the other one of the alleles. Everybody has two copies. And normally we'll have almost, uh, we'll be heterozygous for almost everything, which means that well, this line will go right down the center. If you look at your own SNP genotype, this is what it'll look like. And you'll see that with time and culture, this starts separating into two separate sections, which means that, one of, that this region of the genome has been duplicated. So we can see this happen in real time. We know this is a dynamic process. And then finally, I think this is something that, um, that is important to keep in mind as we get closer to the clinic, and that is that during differentiation, we can select for particular cells that have abnormalities. So if you look at the top here, this is data from Chuck Murray in Seattle. Look at the top. This is kind of messy. You can tell there's probably more than one cell, one, more than one genotype in this population of cells. But uh, five days later, these cells are beating, and they collected the cells that were beating cardiomyocytes. And as you'll notice that the beating cardiomyocytes have very, very clear duplications that we can see right here, three of them. So that means the subpopulation, a subpopulation was better at making cardiomyocytes, and that's why they ended up collecting them. And that has been observed several other times since then in people who are doing cardiac therapy with stem cells. So the take-home message for all of this is you've got to check. You've got to look at the cells at regular intervals. The tools are very easy to use. But you don't want to end up putting cells that are abnormal into people because the consequences would be pretty awful for the entire field, including, of course, the person you put them into. So we have a review on this um, that's coming out soon in the journal JBC with uh, Suzanne Peterson and I wrote about um, a lot of this work and some other work, and so that might be the easier way for you to catch up on, on what's going on in the genome of pluripotent stem cells. Okay, I want to tell you a bit about the epigenome. Again, large sample set. Uh, so what we're looking at in this case is the uh, changing patterns of methylation of DNA 
during uh, time and culture during differentiation. And this is the um, this is uh, um, Kit Nazer's project. He's a graduate student in my lab. I not I don't think he's here because he seems to be completely addicted to the lab. Um, but um, he's been doing enormous analysis on trying to understand how the um, epigenetic landscape changes in cells. Um, I want to show you this because it links the two, uh, two of the parts of my talk. Um, if you, this is a, called a heat map, and this is just a map of all of the um, expression levels or the, or the intensity levels of signals. If you look on the left, you see a, a, a group of uh, pluripotent samples on, on the left-hand side, 155, and then 73 non-pluripotent samples. This is gene expression. This is messenger RNA profiling. And as you see, it's really sort of greenish on the left and sort of reddish on the right. If you look at the same samples using DNA methylation analysis, you get the, ab the absolute opposite. So this is support for the idea, I think, which is generally true, but not always true, that um, methylation of sites and genes is associated with turning off those genes. Okay, so one of the major things that we discovered by looking at this um, epigenome changes was that the X chromosome in female cells was, um, what had a high probability of being on, being, getting turned back on during time and culture. So all of us females have two X chromosomes. You guys only have one. I really feel sorry for you, but you know, that's the way it goes. Um, so we have two X chromosomes, and that means that we have to inactivate one of them in, in all of our cells, and it's random which one gets inactivated. But that means that, that keeps the dosage of the genes on X chromosome the same in males and females. Okay, so we, when we make um, iPS cells, induced pluripotent stem cells from, um, from female cells, um, they originally have the same pattern of X inactivation. That is one X on, one X off, than they did as they, when they were somatic tissues, when they were differentiated tissues. But over time and culture, the second X chromosome starts to turn on. Okay? That's abnormal in, uh, in people. Um, it turns out that it also causes problems in uh, studies of diseases that are linked to the X chromosome. I'll give you one example. So these are a bunch of diseases, um, a bunch of genetic diseases that are, that are on the X chromosome. And I want to focus on one in particular, uh, lesh 9 syndrome. And we found that about half the time, the extra X chromosome, uh, this particular gene was turned on in the iPS cells that we generated. And this can lead to trouble, um, as is the example is, is I'm going to show you here. This is a, a paper from uh, Kevin Egan's lab that came out at the same time as our methylation paper. They were studying this uh, lesh nyan cell lines. They were, um, they were female, and they had one copy of the mutant, one, po one copy of the wild-type uh, gene on their X chromosomes. So when they started growing the cells, the, they had one inactive X chromosome, and that inactive X was mutant. I mean, excuse me, the active X was mutant, the inactive X was wild type. So it had a mutant phenotype. It was almost like it had only one X chromosome. However, they kept the cells in culture for a while and discovered that the phenotype changed from mutant to wild type. Now that's the kind of thing you don't want to have happen in your lab because you have no idea why this sort of thing happens when you're studying, trying to study a disease phenotype. And then they discovered that the reason why it had changed was because the second X, act, uh, gene, X, second X chromosome had become active, the wild type gene was turned on, and the phenotype completely switched. So that's the kind of thing that we realize we have to watch out for when we're looking at all X-linked diseases. Okay, so um, just to give you um, a take-home message about that, um, we find that iPS cells and ES cells are really indistinguishable by the, all the criteria we use. Um, and it's really important to note that we don't really know what this means. We don't know what the implications are for stem cell therapy or for, for, um, for uh, studying diseases in a culture dish. The, the main thing I want you to go home with is the understanding that you have to look at those cells because you, want, you do want to know if they're abnormal or not. It's not something you can sweep under the rug. And the tests are very simple to do. Okay, so um, 
I'm going to give you this very quick, now this one is, I'm not hardly even going to tell you anything. Um, what we discovered was that during differentiation of cells, and they can make anything, so this is, you know, this is an unending project, that we found that the methylation status of uh, genes that were involved in the, um, in the, that were characteristic of the cells we were turning them into, those cells became demethylated, hypomethylated. And that's all those little green spots that I'm showing you that shows that the cells are, are um, that those particular genes that are associated with that tissue, um, their methylation status changes. So um, we were uh, interested in looking at this in a very controlled way. So we, co uh, we set up a collaboration with Steve Dalton, University of Georgia, who is extremely good at um, making cells, d making lineage specific um, cell types. This is not published, so you go ahead, you can write all this down. Um, so we showed, we, he differentiated these, these uh, pluripotent stem cells into three lineages, which all of our embryologists are acquainted with, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. And uh, we made multiple replicates of each one, and then we analyzed them for gene expression, DNA methylation, and we use, also used chromatin analysis for these. And you'll see over in the ectoderm region, um, there's, uh, there are different things that form, uh, like neural crest and then uh, neural precursors. Uh, mesoderm has a lot of things you've probably not heard of, unless you're a trained embryo embryologist. But uh, you can actually, this is, this is a very, uh, very nice lineage, um, di lineage uh, set. And then over in the endoderm, you end up at the very end with cells like hepatocytes and pancreas. So you can see that these are, so when we're making uh, neural precursors, making cells for uh, cardiac myocytes for transplant, and making hepatocytes or pancreas for, uh, for transplant, they all have to go through these lineages because they st all start out pluripotent. Okay, so we s first looked at all the data and discovered that um, that it was very easy to distinguish the different lineages, either on the basis of gene expression, which is on the left, or DNA methylation. So the, you can see those little lineage maps. They go from less from the from the different undifferentiated cells that are black, and then from there you can see them spread out. And the it's extremely typical. All the all the samples act exactly as we'd like to see them act. So uh, Kit, again, um, is, uh, is incorporating all the data he can get his hands on to try to understand how um, lineage is, how cells decide what to become, how do they move forward in what they become. And I'm just going to show you what I call, again, um, stem cells, the universe, and everything. And you don't need to think about this very much. Just pick a spot somewhere on this map and look at it and see how it changes with time as the cells develop. Um, so I have different types of things here, DNA methylation, uh, transcription factors, the gene expression profile, microRNAs. So this is the ectodermal lineage, and I'm just going to really hope this works. <laughs> okay, so here the cells are moving into neural crest, and then they move into the ne a neural crest derivative. And then um, in this one, we're starting with, we go to neural progenitors. You see that the pattern is a little bit different. And then, oops, as they differentiate, I knew I would do that. And as they, um, as they differentiate, they, um, they, they turn on and turn off a different set of genes. I mean, they also, non-coding RNAs also start to become involved. So this is, I think, a nice way of thinking. I mean, it's good for me anyway. Uh, I can just see that there's all this stuff happening when cells go through um, differentiation and lineage selection. And I don't know why, but this will give us the tools to find out what. Um, here's the mesoderm. And again, you see a different kind of pattern emerge as the cells become more differentiated into cardiomyocytes. The DNA methylation profile changes, the gene expression profile changes. Oops, and I'm gonna go back. Uh, this is the problem with this, I'm always trying to jump ahead. Okay, so the muscle. Okay, and here's the endodermal lineage. Okay, here's what we call definitive endoderm, which is the, the first population of cells that we, that we create. And then those cells go on to become um, 
liver cells, and this is the profile that emerges when they become liver cells, or else they go on to make pancreatic islet cells and a different pattern emerges. So this is the kind of thing that we're, we're working on now. We're trying to understand how, um, the, um, how cells change in every possible, using every possible tool that we can come up with, how those cells pick their lineage. And that's going to inform us about how to make particular cell types. It's also going to inform us about what, the cell type, what kinds of cell types we want when we want to study disease or study, uh, develop, uh, study um, transplant cells. Really quickly, I just want to show you how we can integrate all this stuff. We have a project on multiple sclerosis, a cell therapy for multiple sclerosis, which is a collaboration with a group at UC Irvine and a group in Australia. This is funded by CIRM as a translational award. And um, Ron Coleman, who's here, I believe, is the, uh, my graduate student who's working on this. We discovered, as I will just about to show you, is that we may, if we make neural precursor cells and transplant them into a mouse model that has a multiple sclerosis-like um, characteristics, um, then we watch those mice uh, and then analyze them. This is what we see. Would you turn the mov both movies on, too, please? So here on the left are control animals in which you can see that they, they this is the, um, the phenotype of these mice that have had um, part of their nervous system destroyed, uh, at least they, they're demyelinated in their axons, those of you who know about MS. And you can see they're just dragging their hind limbs. Um, after they've been translated, transplanted with the neural precursor cells, you can see three weeks later, they still have the clips in their backs, but they're starting to walk around. Next slide. And then turn these both on, please. This is a durable effect. So six months after transplantation, you'll see that the mice on the, on the left have recovered somewhat, but not really very well, and that the mice that received the transplant are, um, seem to be very close to completely normal. So this astonishing, um, this astonishing observation has led us to an entire project in which we're trying to figure out how to use neural precursor cells to treat multiple sclerosis. And um, the, uh, the problem is uh, that the cells themselves don't seem to be responsible for the, for the cure. They are responsible, but they're not there when the mice start walking. Uh, this shows that the uh, cells, these are human cells in normal mice, they're rejected after seven days. We start seeing the effect three week, in three weeks. And so this is where the genomics starts showing up. We're trying to find out what it is those cells do during the period of time that they are in the animals that leads to this recovery which can last for six months. And so this is just a, a, a small taste. You can look at Ron's poster. Um, we're identifying things that we think might be, um, might be useful, or might be responsible. And among those are uh, the secreted proteins that are things like cytokines, for example. So what we've done is gone back to our stem cell matrix, added more data to it, and we've identified a set of candidates secreted, that are secreted by neural precursor cells, but not by undifferentiated uh, pluripotent stem cells and not by other cell types like fibroblasts. And so these are the, the, the proteins that we think are, might be responsible for this effect that we see that lasts so long. Okay, this is an old picture, but a lot of the people who are in the lab are still in the lab. There are some new people, um, but many of these people have posters here. I urge you to go to the, everything I've talked about will be talked about in more detail in the posters. Um, these are the, the people who are responsible for um, leading a lot of the projects. I didn't talk about all of them, but, um, but they, they're, they're all um, doing very important work in stem cells. And then this is my, last, my list of, uh, Funding and collaborators. As I told you, the collaborators are probably more, they're more important to me than the stem cells at this point because these people trust us with their, their uh, cell lines. Uh, we analyze them, we share the data with them, we've created a network of people that we, uh, that we work with. Our funding comes from CIRM, we get some funding from NIH, we've had funding from Alzheimer's Association, Bill and Melinda Gates, and very importantly, tomorrow I'll talk about the project that's being funded by a, a foundation called Summit for Stem Cell. So um, I think I will close there because I know I'm running over. Thanks. <laughs>